It looks like we're recording. Thank you, Julian. Okay, I'd like to call this meeting to order. It is the Hartford Subcommittee of the MARB. It is March 25th, and uh, the time is 10.07. Um, I'm Kimberly Kennison. I'm the designee for Secretary McCaw. And with me today is Christine Shaw, the designee for Treasurer Wooden. Um, I, I don't have any real opening remarks today. Um, just probably would say I'm, I guess I'm excited. I'm not apprehensive, but I am getting my first COVID shot today. So today is a milestone for me. Um, and I hope all of you um, are healthy and safe during this time. And uh, taking this into consideration as well. Christine, do you have anything that you would like to add? Uh, no, thank you, Ms. Kempton. Okay, good, so good the morning, first item on. Steve Felsig now joining. I'm oh, sorry, thank I'm late. You're fine, thank you, Steve. Thanks for joining us today. Um, the first item on the agenda today is the approval of the minutes of January the 28th, and I am looking for a motion for approval. So moved. Thank you, second. Christine. Who is the second? I'm sorry. Bob. Thank you, Bob. I was looking down. <laughs> um, any discussion? Yes, uh, Ms. Kennison, a uh, question. Um, sure. In the last paragraph uh, before Section 5 begins, uh, other related business, the paragraph leaves with, she asked if the district had estimated the potential cost savings. Who is she? I actually that I think is you. I think you made that and I left that out of the Oh, okay. I left the attribution out, but I, I I distinctly remember that part of the conversation so I can add the attribution. Appreciate that. Yeah. That's the only other <laughs> the only change I recommend. Thank you. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> No other discussion. All right, um, then can we uh, get a roll call of whether you're in favor, um, whether you're opposed or whether you abstain with the added um, adjustment as recommended. All right, Mr. Brockman. You're on mute, Matt. Uh, sorry, I. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Felsigno. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Waxenberg. Aye. Ms. Shaw. Yes. And Ms. Kennison. Yes. All right, that's everybody. Thank you. Um, Okay, the uh, minutes have been approved. Next item on the agenda is the Board of Education fiscal year 2022 um, recommended budget and the superintendent is here with us today and I will ask her to please uh, walk us through um, and present her operating budget. Thank you everyone. Just making sure that I'm um, not sure if um, I did not give you the presentation, although I think Julian, you have it, but I'm going to try to kind of work this on my end. Um, we are not a, we are a Google team over oh. here, so let me try to try this. Julian, can you help her? If if you have any trouble op opening it out or sharing your screen, I'll just share screen and or I can. Then you can just say next slide. So I just want to make sure that you can see what I see. Do you see the presentation? Not yet. No. No? Oh, it's coming. There we go. It's very it's small. There you go. Getting better. There we go. Testing. You got it. Wonderful. OK, so I am um, going to actually do a presentation that actually shares also context 
and know that we are in the process of um, onboarding our new CEFO, knowing that uh, Dave Flake, who was with us, was with us temporarily. We have someone that has been approved by our board and is um, in in their district is um, in the process of transitioning him over to us. And so we should have him on board within 60 to 90 days. In the meantime, um, bear with me. So um, what I'm going to discuss, yes, is our budget, but within the context of the pandemic um, impact on learning, uh, there are some, you know, implications with regard to the SR2 and the guidelines, uh, our budget process, and of course the budget trends and um, some of the economics of our budget. And this is um, a presentation that um, we also, you know, shared with our community and our board. Um, and so essentially, you know, the pandemic has created greater death, breadth, and inequity in student need. And so um, we face urgent needs uh, in the future due to the extensive impact. So. Um, we now are faced with, of course, assessing student learning and social emotional needs, providing extra time, staff, and even programming for recovery and um, providing social emotional support, um, overlaying all of that uh, to the uh, financial sustainability dynamics and challenges that we were tackling also before. So the current uh, it was it's no longer proposed. The board has has approved, uh, but the budget did have um, some pieces there that uh, rely on um, state level uh, budgeting. Um, the proposed state level budget includes, as you as you all know, pauses scheduled increase for ECS payments, um, uses federal COVID funds to make up for some of the gaps related to ECS funding freeze. Um, you know, there's a raise in, in charters per per pupil grants, and it calls for expanding internet access. I needed to kind of lift these things for for my board so that they were aware. And um, there were also implications because the current budget proposed, um, you know, the flattening of the ECS poses a revenue risk for us. It's a 3.4 of our revenue in the budget presumes that right we continue the um, receiving the ECS funding through the increase in Alliance grant and um, also um, COVID funding in places in place of the ECS funds limits our options for uh, general operating expenses. Um, you know, we still are learning more as to what the ARP uh, funds will allow. And so perhaps these will not be an issue in terms of um, what we would need uh, 3.4 a uh, million for, but I needed to raise this for for our board as part of their decisions um, when they were considering approving or not approving our budget. I did also include um, for our board, um, right, some ifs, ifs, thens, um, and some options that we would explore. So if the governor's proposed budget didn't pass or, um, you know, we were, uh, we had to determine uh, $3.4 million um, disinvestments. You know, I added specific uh, moves that we could potentially make. Um, and so I won't get into those here now, but um, they're they're here. Um, all of all of them would have right implications across schools. Um, I'm actually going to kind of rush through this, given that um, this was more informational for our board as to the categories that the state Department of Education has identified um, to allow um, ESSER two fund expenditures on. And then we get into our budget development process, which sought to um, achieve uh, what we had committed to, right? Stability, making sure that we continue to use the equity-based funding as a foundational uh, pillar, um, making sure that we had strong alignment to our core priorities of the district, which were identified in collaboration with our community. Simplicity, um, and making sure that we were able to accelerate the process from November to January, uh, which resulted in you know the board approving the budget um, for the first time ever, uh, in you know early on uh, in February, 
Um, and then sustainability, thinking through how is it that we're going to um, um, get ahead of us in terms of the budget so that we can, for example, um, get a better footing on our rec recruitment and, and hiring processes. Usually we had to wait until the board approved the budget in May, and um, by that time we would lose the, the best candidates to other districts who had done their budgeting uh, development process and approvals um, earlier on in the spring. Madam Superintendent, before you proceed, what, what do you mean by equity based funding? Yes, I can actually um, get into that in a few slides from now. OK, thank you. Yes. Um, we did invest in uh, some budget software, Alaview, um, which is a cloud based point and click technology. It does simplify uh, budget processes and provides clear insight into monthly spending at the district, at the school level. And um, it also allows for community view into school level budgets. This is something that um, you know was identified as an ask of our community and of our board um, to have uh, easily accessible um, finance information. And so we are looking to we did roll this out at the central office level and plan to do that at the school level um, next year for community access. It's just a simple uh, view of, of. The program, OK, so with regard to our expenditures and the ongoing needs of the district, and this will get to the question as to the equity based budget in a minute, um, I do want to give you a glance as to district enrollment and I wanted to include some of these data points here because they directly connect to the conversation that we will have um, later about uh, special education um, and out of district uh, costs. So you can see here that, um, you know, prior to 2019, the average annual increase was, you know, about 2.6%. Um, in 2019 and 2020, the average decline was 5.2%. And so overall enrollment was down uh, 6% or uh, 1,127 students uh, this year. And this includes um, enrollment counts include students in, in Hartford Public Schools and in our outplaced uh, facilities as well. This is getting a little bit in the weeds, but um, it gives you um, an idea as to school specific um, enrollment changes. And essentially, you know, the headline here um, is that 54% of the schools had a decline in enrollment this year. And, um, you know, you see that there's a, a very specific grouping here that you see to the left. Um, you know, these happen to be our, our community schools, our neighborhood schools, and, you know, have an enrollment drop of almost 14% from, from last year. You know, we see that magnet school enrollment was up 48 students um, and overall. Um, you know, neighborhood school enrollment is down 990 students from 2019. So, you know, we think about longer term implications and the work that we did for three years to consolidate right size. Um, Co-locate our district that resulted in, you know, closures of 20% of our schools um, and and then COVID happened, right? So um, we're still not sure what that's going to mean for future enrollment, um, but it does it does have implications for us as we think about what three years from now is going to look like after um, we begin, right? We're stabilized again. Uh, this is an illustration of the per pupil funding by school. Um, we, we haven't yet determined the exact level of funding per pupil, right? Because we have schools that, um, you know, offer different programs, specialties and have different needs. There's clearly an optimization level of funding to school size, which um, again, we tried to tackle during our uh, consolidation plan in the last three years, which resulted in that 20% of of closing of, of, of our schools and programs. Um, 
and we see the left side of the graph that illustrates primarily schools with less than 300 students. And you know the funding per pupil in those schools is two to two and a half times that of schools with five to six hundred students, which you know I don't I think we've talked about that before here. Um, but I wanted to you know kind of give you the aerial view. To the question about the equity based school funding, um, we actually. Um, years years ago when I arrived, there were um, lots of there was lots of confusion as to you know what what is equitable? Um, how come some schools are getting more than others? There was really no formula for that. Um, and and we did do a deep dive and realize that there was significant inequity that we as a district actually were perpetuating. Um, specifically in magnets versus non magnets, right? I'll give you an example. There was a a, a magnet school that um, you know was uh, spending eleven hundred dollars more per kid uh, than you know a neighboring uh, neighborhood high school, um, and so um, with less students. And so we we had to step back and identify a a school started our starter budget right to kind of normalize things and then identify um, our equity prior our priority base our equity based priorities and you see those at the bottom um, and that was we identified schools that um, needed additional supports because of the higher number of English learners um, and schools that had um, additional needs given their high levels of chronic absenteeism because we know that you know, chronic absenteeism is indicative of um, additional needs that students and families might have. And um, we had an equity priority around our middle schools, given that as part of our consolidation plan, one of the strategies was to have standalone uh, neighborhood middle schools. Um, and we know that middle schoolers need additional different uh, programming. And then lastly, a equity priority around magnet school supplement, even though we identified significant inequities in funding where all of our magnet schools were getting significantly more money than our neighborhood schools were per student. We also didn't want to completely destabilize our magnet programs, given that um, you know our, min, our programs, magnet programs do serve students well. Um, we wanted to make sure that we, you know, had a stabilizing piece there. And so the way to get at that was um, through a magnet school supplement. This is um, a visual that I believe I've, I've shared, probably have shared with you in the past, but um, this is our tuition growth rate, um, as you can see for out of district tuition. I mean, it has um been cut but um it also shows you there um you know the growth and and we we have a whole conversation about that come with you all about you know tuition and out of district placements but um again um an aerial view here um we know that the costs have been increasing but there's been a a, a slowing down of the growth curve um and i know that we have to analyze this further um, and then we get into um, overall, right? The the funding position remains within one percent of the current year. Um, this does include the expected increase in our alliance grant as part of the ongoing ECS funding. Um, the changes include the local tax number declining due to a shift of where the 5.6 million non-lapsing funds are booked. Uh, the funds are now in the city's account and will be provided back to us uh, as requested. So this is no longer revenue for us. That's um, now rather it's a credit to our expense. And if you see, you know, federal federal funds are essentially the same, although we we do anticipate having Title One dollars uh, that carry over into next year. And our state level grants are down slightly as we uh, expect a slight reduction um, in our magnet operating grant. As with uh, this year, um, we are expecting lower non-resident enrollment in magnet schools. So 
So I just discussed the revenue on the previous slide, and so I um, want to give a glance here as to some of our our expenses. Um, minimal changes to salaries as contractual union um, increases um, were offset by lower salaries of new hires. Uh, purchased property services um, expenses are down. I don't. I'm sure you all remember that. Um, we have moved to Buckley High School, and we've eliminated the the rent at uh, Main Street. Um, system wide services are up due to our o out of district uh, tuition costs. Um, equipment is slightly up here. You're going to see that because of um, the increase that we uh, have in the Carl Perkins grant. It's a you know state uh, grant through uh, the Department of Ed um, for um, career technical education, um, use of new technology being purchased uh, with this grant. And then other miscellaneous services are up for two reasons. One, um, last year the 12.4 deficit um, was booked in this line, mm -hmm. and this year, this is where the non-lapsing uh, credit of the 5.6 was booked, and of course, the difference between those two is 6.6 .6 million. So it looks like an increase in costs when it's actually a reduction um, in the credit to the budget. Um, and then um, Sandry is down due to lower fringe costs. Um, lower fringe costs are down due to low use of um, lower usage and um, have been validated by Seagull, uh, the Seagull partners. And this is a more um, specific view of um, our cost drivers here. These are, um, this is a little bit in the weeds, but um, the budget, um, you know, there were investments in the budget already. Um, Weaver, Weaver High School has a, a, it's gonna have a student success center. Um, we do need school and family technology support, right? We now uh, have moved to become a one-to-one -one district and um, we only had one person um, to serve the district with regard to instructional technology needs, even though we have a shared service with the city for uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, in the world of education, infrastructure alone doesn't um, meet the needs of instructional technology use, right? Having, having um, infrastructure um, doesn't uh, build capacity, for example, in teachers to use technology to improve their instruction or to student learning. So we needed to have additional staff there. We um, did uh, include in the budget to uh, ADA specialist and benefits uh, manager um, due to the needs that we have seen um, throughout the, the pandemic and that we continue to, to address. We are also including the two contact tracing nurses, you know, in a district of 17 and a half thousand students and 3,400 staff. Um, it's been key having those additional nurses to only focus on contact tracing. And we did include an investment in athletics as well, um, given that we want to build a continuum of athletics um, that uh, expand beyond the middle school. And so beginning in fourth grade, having opportunities for fundamental um, programs for students. And then you know you see to to the right there um, some tactical updates uh, included in in the budget. Utilities reduced to reflect the forecast from Bridge Energy. There were five vacant positions that we did eliminate. Um, we had to add some FTEs per principal feedback, and of course uh, the special education um, investments and or reductions are a fluid process. And so if there were um, needs that had to be identified, they were included again based on um, individualized education plans at schools. And that concludes the presentation.
Thank you, Thank Superintendent. You, Superintendent. You're welcome. So, so anyone, anyone have, have any have questions? Any questions? I'm, 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 The tuition, for, the, the tuition for uh, charter schools, even though the state law says that they aren't supposed to charge tuition, is that based on the MOUs that you have with the charter school? Does that include the MOU with the charter? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, why are you paying tuition when the law says you're not, the charters aren't supposed to charge tuition? My assumption is that it's based on the MOU you have uh, with them, but I thought there was an opt-out clause for payments. I don't understand why you're paying tuition to achievement first is what I'm getting at. Uh, for out-of-district placement? Uh, is that your question? Yes, I mean, you have Hartford students going to achievement first charter school because that's supposed to be they are not to charge tuition from the sending school district my question is you have an item that says tuition why is the item say tuition yeah so that includes tuition for out of district placements so um we don't pay the charter additional tuition dollars, but if there's a student that they have that is outplaced, we have to pay that tuition. So it's not tuition to them. It's if a student is a special education student that they place to whatever school they place it, you pay for that placement. Yes, whether it's the charter that that does the placement or, uh, you know, a as you as you well know, right? It's a magnet provider or open choice district. Yes. Okay. So I I have a question. This is Steve Felsig now. Yes. Steve. Um, and this is just looking at at the trends where you have a significant reduction in student body population per school. Um, <clears throat> And I know that you probably have can't really tell what the future looks like because of the COVID issues. Um, but it, and again, I'm not um, well versed in the field of education. I'm, I was just a business guy. So looking at the trends that continue to go down on a year to year basis with the amount of pupils that you have in each school um, and just looking at it from a business standpoint and I know that it, and I'm not suggesting that you look at children as a business and but it, it is an investment a huge yeah. investment um, for the city of Hartford and I'm just kind of curious where and at what point do you look at a school and say you know the trends in the tuition are going down and we have less and less students yeah. every year at what point do you try to um, consolidate management principles um cleaning of the school uh, at what point do you decide that you just can't support that local having that local school and i'm not suggesting that you're at that point because i don't know um well you know you're the superintendent but there's got to be a sweet spot where somewhere along the line you got to look at it and say uh you know the demographics have changed and um we have less and less students or are you losing the students to private schools, to Catholic schools? Um, what's you know, is there is there a re is there a reason why you think the trend might reverse? I, I I don't know. I don't know the answer to any of these questions. But as I look at the numbers, this is just kind of what you know pops into my mind. Um, so yeah, no, great questions. And um, so you know, we just finished. Uh, the three year consolidation plan, right? right? That actually was answered, that answered, that got to answer the questions that you were posing. 
right? I, I came on and as you see back to 2014, right? I mean, the, I, 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 um, I have to imagine that enrollment projections were done before and that, you know, this trend had to have been predicted uh, nonetheless, right? So um, it is the consolidation process that I engaged in, which resulted in, in us, uh, you know, taking 12 facilities offline and closing and consolidating, right? 20% of our schools. Uh, and we identified that, you know, it's really hard for a school going below 300 students um, becomes really hard. And we knew that when the district primarily had a K-8 a kinder through eighth grade design. And we had middle school grades, a middle school that had 60 students, 80 students. And it was really hard one to staff and to really serve students really well. So it's part of the whole redesign. We had to then have smaller standalone middle schools in order to be able to consolidate and create pre-K five schools to right size them. Now with this projection, and, and because we know that, um, you know, the, for example, magnet schools, uh, ex, uh, offerings of magnet seats will continue to expand. And, you know, as part of the, the chef um, requirements, you know, 50% students have to come from Hartford, right? I mean, it is to serve Hartford students. And so they are going to come from neighborhood schools. And so that is going to have a, a continue to have implication. And if you remember the slide that I showed um, that had, um, you know, those seven schools that were um, already at this time under 300 students, those were all neighborhood schools that when we consolidated, merged and received students from other schools that closed. And so, um, you know, does it mean that we have to engage in another consolidation? Um, I don't know, but um, there's going to be an economy of scale, which is like what I think you're you're getting at, um, and it's an economy of scale situation um, in which we're not going to be able to serve students well um, because, you know, unless we say, well, we're going to have a principal, for example, that's going to go across two campuses and, you know, how feasible um, is that? Um, so it, it is a challenge um, and and it's it's hard um, for predictability purposes as well. Um, we know that um, students, you know, are shifting from from neighborhood schools to charters or magnets up until October. And so it creates a significant amount of disruption operationally for us as the sending district because right, we have to, we have the budget for a certain amount of staff and things might completely change, you know, in in October, which then has to, you know, creates uh, class size issues for us per per budget and per contract. Right. We have to say, well, we can't have a class of 13 kids, so we have to consolidate and it creates these bigger ripple effects be, in addition to Mr. Uh, I'll say, you know, the ones that you're that you're lifting. Um, so those are real. Those are real challenges that you're asking about. And we just did a massive a three year process that resulted, yes, in the consolidation and reduction of 20 percent of our schools, but 25 percent of our school students. Experience a disruption. Because well, I remember we, when you uh, I think I remember when you first came on the uh, the job your first introduction was uh i remember watching you on tv <laughs> and it it wasn't a very, a very friendly crowd when you were trying to consolidate some of those schools so i'm certainly not suggesting that i mean i know you just went through that and it's a it's a long process but unfortunately uh you know the you know numbers that's the one thing i know about numbers they really don't lie um you are you are absolutely and that's perfect. really unfortunate um so I, I obviously I'm not telling you something you don't know, but uh, it is it is alarming, and you know you see a a, 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 a huge expenditure um, for the city of Hartford, and that's uh, you know. So, but anyway, even thank so, you for your answer, and I, I know there's no, you know, true and fast easy solution to any of this, but 
it's just something that uh, I was just kind of curious. At what point is there a, you know, is, is there a sweet spot where you think that you need to, you know, group schools together, or you know, and I'm not suggesting you, you're there, but you know, something else. So, Stephen, I'd like to piggyback off of your comment, um, just so you're um, all aware. I did twenty. I did about 25 years in higher education and yes, it's not the same, but it is still dealing with um, providing a service to a student. And in higher education, what we did was um, from either a programmatic level, so the types of programs and the type of um, you know degrees that you offer is very important as well as the needs of the market of where people can get a job or not get a job. So it's a little different, but in that we created a model and in this model it's called the break even and so if we find out what's the capacity of each school and or program in in my world and within those programs and it could be colleges because um in some places we had multiple colleges um and within those programs we <clears throat> we had to shed light on those that were diminishing and because they're costing and you do not want to continue to invest into a program that isn't attractive. So there's got to be reasons why, whether it is the demographics and there's less kids out there for you to serve. Um, it, we're coming out of a baby boomer. And after that, I heard that the demographics are less. But as you project out, like, you know how many children and births there are in every year and what you can see come down the track in, in, in Hartford. And as you look out for those, what is the break even of a school to operate and what are the needs and what are the capacities so that this way you don't pay a larger price tag for something that uh, is, is not giving you the best bang for your buck. There's that cost beneficial piece of it. And so when you mentioned, um, you know, the 300 number, um, I quickly went to your headcount numbers um, that you provided in your presentation, which was on page eight. And I think it would be helpful if I knew, if we knew the MARB, you know, what's the capacity of each one of these schools? So if the capacity is a 500 size school, and you only have 200 kids in there, I think it's important to know that. So, so these are some of the things that we looked at in higher education, like in dorms. So the capacity of a dorm versus how much is vacant. And we learned that p students were moving to live in houses and they weren't using the dorm structure. So um, I, I think that some of that would be a very good analysis. I'm sure you have this information because you have to have it for fire code on how many kids are in each one um, can fill these schools. And then the next thing is, is the cost cost that goes with the school. So as you mentioned, some of them were spiking and um, I didn't have your presentation in hand. So I literally um, went through every single one of your pages to get a, a cost price per each school per student. And some of them are more alarm alarming than others. Some of them, the cost is running around the average, I would say it's around $11,000 a kid, 11 to 12,000 a kid. But then you have some schools like this um, Burns Latino um, Studies Academy. I don't know anything about it, but that price point is $21,000 $21, a kid versus $11,000 a kid. So I want to say, why is that? And, you know, I see that they have, you know, 21 21% is in special education there. Maybe that's part of it, the needs of that special education. I don't really know, but I do think it's important to know why is this school costing almost double the others? Because they're going to, they're, maybe they're getting better education. Maybe they're not. Maybe their needs are higher. I don't know that. You're absolutely correct, actually. And that, that's a, very uh, good example of a school that actually does serve um, that has a specialized program. Okay. Right? Not only do they have a okay. pre-K, there's a pre-K magnet there, there is a, a, a specialized program there in addition to their um, uh, regular um, neighborhood elementary school. Um, and so, yes, um, you know, and if, and if th there are a few others. Um, yes. Rawson, for example, Rawson also has specialized program. Uh, Naylor 
has specialized program. And by the way, those were efforts um, to bring kids back, kids and keep kids from being outplaced. So, um, you know, it does have implications. The other piece that you spoke about in terms of capacity, all of that work was actually done as part of the consolidation, um, sure. right? We, we, you know, that was one of the um, principles considered when we uh, tiered and ranked schools, you know, how many schools were operating under 80 percent, you know, capacity. Um, how we use that coupled with how many schools, um, um, how many facilities were like level four, level five facilities, meaning that we should not have students in a level five facility because that means that those facilities should actually be closed. Because what does that mean, a level five? They, level it has five too, much, means, too much work to be complete infrastructure? Yes, and that, that we really well, should not have students there, that the di level of disinvestment okay. in, in repairs Got it. Uh, does not, should not have any child in, in there, any Got child, it. any staff member. So okay. those are some of the decision, you know, points that we that we had in addition to because we weren't just closing schools because of a, an economy of scale issue. Sure. We were we were also leveraging the opportunity to say, look, we we live within an ecosystem of school choice. So how do we figure out how Harvard Public Schools, who is the feeder system, by the way, to magnets and open choice and charters, you know, stabilize? even though we'll never get to a stabilized place, by the way. When when we have students to leave our schools up until October, it becomes an operational challenge for us. And quite frankly, it creates significant inequities. Um, so we're, we're solving for inequity on one end, but we create significant inequity in another side, on, on the other side. So on some of these large variances where they've taken a, a, a large decrease, which is um, Burr Middle School went down 256 kids. Do you know where those kids went and and why? So I will tell you what happened at Burr. Burr was one of our last uh, consoli uh, reconfigurations. So okay. Burr was a K-8 school and it became a standalone middle school. And so that one was an expectation. Right, that from K eight, you go to only middle schools. It's going to be a smaller, um, a smaller school. Warwick, and that one was one of the latest. That, that was a th the year three is when their shift happened, okay. and so we we still need to kind of stabilize um, enrollment there. Okay. They actually just became a, a, they opened their middle school in the middle of a pandemic. Oh, um, so when the so when the um, consolidation of that school took place, and you had a realized loss of students because it became a middle school. Did you have um, a significant increase in elementary schools in the area where those other kids went? So in other um, words, if you lost 200 kids, did you pick up 200 kids, 100 at two schools, or or was there a, um, was there a uh, mitigation of less students redeployed to the elementary so if you got so if you consolidated and you gained 200 at one school or or you you consolidated to two 200 students where the 200 students go that were in uh, k through six i assume it's k through six right yes and that's a great question so they did uh fan out if you will to a few other schools um so an example from you're testing my my knowledge this is good so burr um, is a feeder to Dwight Belize, for example, um, to Naylor, and I'm for, and uh, MD Fox, and so um, you still we still see a change in some of those schools um, because it wasn't just the feeder, right? So some were feeding to those schools, but but then some other students, you know, went to magnets, charters, open choice. Um, So we're, we're trying to control for what we can within this other larger ecosystem of of uncertainty, quite frankly. So, you know, um, and this is just on a, on a personal note. Um, I knew we were having this meeting. So um, my, <clears throat> my son who goes to Yukon Law and has a house over on Whitney, um, there's a school over there. And I knew that we we're having this conversation. So I 
um, as as in typical some very in 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 Italian families, we want to make sure everybody's fed well. So um, I'm usually <laughs> making the uh, the trip from Woodbridge to uh, Whitney to bring uh, you know the weekly uh, um, food rations. But um, there was a school over there, and I sat for about ten or fifteen minutes um, and just watched how many um, kids were kind of coming in and out as compared to um, what I noticed back, you know, a little less than a year ago when he started. And um, I have to say that it was an awful big building and I didn't see a lot of kids coming out of the school. So I don't know if that's some of the trends that we're talking about or that I'm noticing. Um, and I know it's a challenge for you. And I, and I, as I said, I, 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 I believe in education. So I, I really want to see the kids from Hartford have the best education possible. But I think um, just looking at some of the size of these buildings and, and, and uh, the amount of kids that are in them, I, I think there's, unfortunately, I think you're going to be at a, a point soon where you're going to have to reanalyze all this again. Yeah, I don't know when when that was that you were looking at the students coming in and out. And if it was during a pandemic, then that, you know. Yeah, well, the pandemic is, yeah. you know, all bets are off with that. But Correct. It, it was an awful big, uh, big building. And, um, you yeah, know, it's just my, I mean, you know, again, I'm not an educator, so. But I, I will. You know, Christine, but what Ms. Tennyson said was, I think, really significant to know. The numbers? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Christine? Madam Superintendent, I just wanted to to follow up on the, the question, the line of questioning that Ms. Kennison offered. You know, one of the, the challenges in, in, in evaluating um, this this budget and uh, trying to understand that the, the drivers of some of the costs is, for my part, you know, I want to distinguish between what I believe are extraordinary needs within the district. We've talked over the course of many, many meetings about the uh, particular needs of the population of kids in the Hartford school system and really trying to understand and to, to recognize that and to make sure that the appropriate resources are available and to understand that in some instances, greater investment, more expenditure is needed because of the particular needs of this population. But I also wanna just kind of distinguish that recognition from the, from the reality that we really wanna understand the cost from a more clinical perspective, from a more analytical perspective. And, and it's difficult, this, these, you know, and, and Mark Waxenberg has driven a lot of the questioning on this, which has been helpful. We've discussed the necessity for really, you know, in the context of the special education, uh, expenditures, what that what that really looks like, and and, and having a meaning, meaningful comparison. I know that that analysis continues uh, and is underway. But what is what is challenging, and, and this is to Miss Kennison's point, how is it that we can better understand kind of some of the at a more granular level what is tr what what are truly heightened expenses by virtue of aging infrastructure and, and economies of scale. And, you know, you have, you know, fixed costs where it costs a certain amount to keep a school open, no matter how many kids are in there. How is it that there can be a better kind of sense of what those, where the opportunity for savings lies? I mean, that's, I, I'm having a difficult time really kind of digging beneath the numbers a little bit. Because again, you know, the recognition that there are extraordinary needs, it's not lost on me. And these kids aren't widgets. So let me just be clear. This is not right. a purely economic assessment. However, the economics and the resources need to be directed to where they're needed most. And if there's hemorrhaging within the system, if there are inefficiencies, in my mind, we need to find those so that we can redirect the, the resources to where they're most needed. So how is it, so without all that said, um, could you comment on the the um, the heightened, I, I think there was an RFP issued for an outside consultant to help analyze some of the special education expenses. Could you talk, I know, I know you're expecting new staff whose main responsibility will be to address some of these enduring questions, but could you comment on that and, and the extent to which that analysis can inform uh, your expectations for their future budgetary needs? Yes, so uh, before going there, I want to try to address some of the other um, points that you lifted. 
Um, and and want to just remind us that like all of these things that you're lifting, we did as part of the three year consolidation plan um, and looking under the rocks right under every rock. What does it mean to close 12 facilities and release 12 facilities? You know, at the end of the day, those are not big. Those are not big long term um, cost savings. I mean, three hundred fifty thousand dollars here. Right. When we think about a four hundred twenty million dollar budget. Right. So I just wanted to put it in context. Um, and to your point about uh, need, that's where equity comes in, right? A school that has 20% students with learning differences is a very different level of need than a school that has 5% level, right? Because there's a the need is higher and the, the need is concentrated. Um, the same thing with with you know students that are you know learning English as a second language. So um, those are all very real. Um, and the special education piece. Um, um, you know, we can we can. We're we're thinking through the RFP, the the what we're still having a challenge is identifying the what, what is it that we're trying to get at, which we can we can shift to that conversation now um, because there's there's also a challenge there with with the predictability, Ms. Shaw, right, as to how many students will will go into the, um, you know, the special education um become you know require special education um, services um that's that's also hard to tell um and that is that is not separate from the the regular education um continuum right we have to make sure that as any district right has a um a regular ed continuum to to meet the needs of all students really well that potentially Right, can address needs early on and you know not have a, an over reliance on special education um, referrals. I'm not saying that there's an over reliance, right? That's what that RFP that you're talking about, Ms. Shaw, would potentially help us, um, you know, uh, uh, get to. Uh, but you know, um, to to I think what we have to be very careful about is to only think of um, you know, special education needs as, as the cost, the only cost drive, right? I know that's not what right. you're saying, Ms. Shaw. I know that's definitely not what you're saying. We just want to understand it better. Um, right. But And perhaps this is an opportunity where um, I know that um, I had shared a memo with you all from Patrick um, mm -hmm. Gibson, who I, I thought I saw on the call. Um, and I don't know if this is a good opportunity to have him also give his um, his overlay uh, when they actually analyze mm -hmm. all of our special education data. Um, I guess before you hop to that on in just that focus, because it is a separate line item on the agenda. Oh, yes, sorry about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would want to make sure that we ask all of our questions about the, the budget first, Got and it. then you can make the specialization of uh, talking about special ed. Um, but to make sure that the members have asked all of their questions about the budget, if if we don't mind. Yeah, so Ms. Shaw, we'll, we can come back to your question then. Yep. I'm not going to ignore it, Christine, because I'm hoping it comes out in our um, in the presentation of everything with special ed. But let's just make right. sure that. And, and, and just to be clear, um, I, I cited um, the line of inquiry around the special education expenditures over the last several months as an example yes. of the kind of focus inquiry on what ex what is Hartford paying for for its regular education students. And you know what you know, Ms. Kennison, you pointed out the per the dramatic per pupil distinction between Burr and what was it? Was it um Burns Burns oh, Latino Burns. um study studies academy. Okay. It's a K through five school mm -hmm. on page 16 has a um cost per student at 21,000. If I take that and do a K through, well, this one has a pre-K through five, mag, that's a magnet school, so it's probably not a good example. But anyways, um, even, even that, let me use that. That has 344 students. The Burns School has 222 students, okay? Um, there, the, again, Burns has a, a higher um, need, in special ed okay christine right. in this example but 
this this school um, per pu pupil cost is eleven thousand eight hundred. So and right, the other so one I'm is twenty one thousand seven hundred. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. So, so really that, understanding. So so again, the same uh, kind of inquiry that we're directing to um, the special education costs obviously yes. it impacts this. Yes. I'd like to better understand why the extraordinary difference beyond, you know, just a, you know, reference to infrastructure. I, I think you may have mentioned earlier um, that that is an important inquiry just for, I think, our understanding and appreciation for, you know, are there opportunities? So, so to to Mr. Falsigno's point and others points, you know, consolidation, you know, um, economies of scale could be, and again, I, I know that you, you're you elbow deep in this, um, Madam Superintendent, and, and I'm just trying to better understand what is accounting for that extraordinary difference and how is it that we could be supportive of efforts to, you know, explain, not only explain that, but ensure that resources are, the right resources are, are directed to the, the students who need them most. Yeah, so um, if if you have specific questions, I can certainly answer with regard uh, to uh, Burns, for example, it is again, um, it offers a specialized program for students that have mm -hmm. uh, complex needs. Um, okay. And so you're talking about um, speech therapy, occupational therapy, clinical supports, uh, one to one para educator educators. Um, and, and we have several of those throughout the district, right? We have one at Rawson, we have one at Naylor. Um, we have some at, at some of our some of our high schools, um, which has been our approach to address the out of the increasing out of district needs, uh, out of district placement. So, um, you know, it, it's we have to offset it by 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 somehow either we send the student out right to an out of placement facility. Are you invest? Right. Um, that you know can cost us eighty thousand dollars a year, or right, we solve for it internally by building these programs and using the space that we have to co-locate these programs um, mm -hmm. and and identify an efficiency from a facilities perspective. And so, Burr Burr Elementary is also another high price point with um, seventeen thousand dollars per pupil there. Um, but again, they're at a 20% special ed. So I, I'm now trying to get the correlation. Now, once we get the correlation, um, we then can understand, um, you know, are they, the next thing I, di I didn't compare would be the, um, the number of staff that you need to support that special education component. Which, um, is, it's significantly, uh, variable yeah. um, because it depends on each student's individualized education plan. I understand. Right. Um, it, for example, we if we we have a program that services early grades. There is um, you will likely find a lot of um, speech therapy uh, that is that is needed um, or occupational uh, therapy for students that are in our early grades. Um, we have a uh, breakthrough magnet north, for example, um, who has in their facility our early childhood education transitioning team and support students with, um, you know, complex high levels of needs. But there are babies, right? There are there are pre kers that have, you know, large, you know, just an added level of need. So um, we it's it's. We have to look at it on a one-to-one -one, um, case to identify. There is no formula, if you will, for a a school that has 20% special education, right? Because all of those are are very different, right? So Moylan is another one. Breakthrough North, Harfra High, Buckley. Um, I mean, I can go on. West Middle. Martin Luther, yep. MLK, Martin Luther yep. King, there's, right, Martin you can Luther see King. them. Yep. If you that's another 17,000, yep. yep. And that has a 21%, um, 22 almost percent special ed. Um, okay, so I do think that what these budgets don't allow is, um, it just says instruction, what line item 
would be the support of dollars besides salaries? Do you think it's just salaries? You So you know how we look in the big budget and then you can see that their special ed is like one line. So you want, we, we know um, those costs, but within the individual budgets, it's not grouped into a, a programmatic level. These are like um, objects. It is it's through salaries, right? When when we write yeah. an IEP, um, uh, okay, an individualized education plan IEP, um, okay. right? It's 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 hours provided by staff. Okay, so those will be the increased salary dollars for the staffing, for the education. Okay, correct. Thank you. You know, it could be like a 0.5 um, service that's that's in a school because you have 10 students that need occupational therapy versus the school in the next zone that has two occupational therapists because more of those students need right hours of occupational therapists. Um, can you tell me what is the occupational therapist title if I look down the resources? It doesn't say occupational. I see the speech in the list of so that one pops out to me. But I, I don't know what they're called. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, I think Ms. Hoffman is on, on the line, but do you see an OT, occupational therapy? No, I don't see anything called OT. For, for so it, it will say, maybe it's special ed para? No, no, that's, that's, no. That, that's a special education para, para okay. educator. Okay. What kind of support or what would the, what kind of positions would these folks be for the special ed certified certified right so I'm looking in the certified grouping and what I, can you tell me where you're looking oh on on a regular just one of any on one of these school, budgets school budget yeah school budget yeah yeah okay um okay so there's a special education line you think that that's what it's where they're grouped so some of the positions may show up in in grants. Some of the positions may show up in central uh, central office because we have a a group that's at central office that services the schools. Others are specific to a a school. These are the ones that are specific to a school because I'm looking at the individual school budget. So I'm not looking at the central. I'm looking at everybody's that's within this budget for this school. And the people, you told me that the the full-time equivalents and the number of people that are here. So based on the cost that I'm I'm equating for each school, it says how many bodies are here. Yes. And what I'm saying okay. is that there are there is a group at central office that does service the schools, but they belong to a centralized budget. Uh, understand that would not cause this particular cost to go up it means that it costs even more yes could be it costs even more than the eighteen thousand that i'm looking at for you know cs ccsu leadership academy um because that cost i didn't include but but what this budget tells me in the head count that is here the number of professionals certified professionals that you have here um, are included in this budget, and the cost per student there is eighteen thousand dollars a kid, a student. Yes. So, so in I'm trying to understand which positions are special ed. Yes. So, so you you brought to my attention speech. So I looked at the speech um, professional under certified, and I just found one that says special education. So those two categories are special ed. Are there any others? Did you see social workers? Yes, I do. Yes, uh, school okay. psychologists are are usually not identified per school, but okay. we have you know we have a cohort of those also at central office that um, although they're at central office, I mean they don't service anyone at central office. They're they're servicing schools throughout throughout the the district. Para educators um, as well. So, para is the non. So, okay, so I didn't include, th those are those are specialized for special ed. So if it says special ed para, 19 people, those folks are all for special ed. Correct. Okay. 
OK. I will I will say something else with regard to speech therapy. We contract out with an agency, given that there is a shortage of speech and occupational therapists in Connecticut and actually, quite frankly, throughout the country. Um, and so um, we they might not show up as staffing because they're not attached to um, you know the staffing roster of a school, but we pay for those through you know the contract with the agency. And I believe we have four agencies. I think that this this is something that might have come through the MARB at some point um, for review. Okay, it is that contracting um, centralized, or is it is the is the costs um, pushed out to each individual school for the services that each school is getting? It is it is centralized, but centralized. It is, but but it is it is pulled from the FTE allocation at a school. So the, is it is it included in this budget at the school level? No, the no. budget for the that service is in the central office. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and that's for speech. Well, that's for speech. That's for um, OT, occupational therapy. Yep. And we've even had to rely on them for uh, psychologists. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from the board members? Um, I'm going to be conscious of our time so that we can get on to the other topics. OK, I guess not. Then let's move on to the. Oh, uh, uh, Bob. sorry, sorry for the last minute. Um, is there any. Um, mechanism by which the board uh, submits to the MARB, either through the city or otherwise, a three or five year plan. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, the back and forth that we've just had, um, really you're trying to take from uh, micro data to sort of some broader issues that I think both you and Christine said is is you know what what uh, critical needs are not being met and and what opportunities for savings are there so that they can be redirected. I, I don't know if 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 you and the superintendent were were on the same page and maybe the CFO would would uh, be able to help. But I'm just wondering if the process without adding to the and I'm not suggesting this because I don't want to add to the superintendent's list she's up to her thank you <laughs> and I, you're up to your elbows and alligators and um, she needs a cfo <laughs> yeah um so but, but but again if if there's some mechanism to to do that um i think it may be worthwhile because you, you're talking again you know on on different levels and yep. um yep. I, I i think there we need to that's because she's an educator and I'm a finance gal. I, that's, well, no, and, and people have to learn, you know. Um, right, right. You know, right. so we, we've got to talk each each other's language to be able to um, uh, ask, you know, because some of the things I heard is, you know, a $10,000 gap in per pupil is because the need was higher. And if the goal is to redirect resources to where the need is highest, um, I didn't know if the superintendent was saying we're doing that. Um, it just so look at those discrepancies because th there's a need. We're doing that. We're doing that because we have to by federal law already, right? Well, so no. <laughs> yeah, you have to fulfill the need. We we have to an, an individualized law student, that may not be the same thing. <laughs> an individualized student plan calls for service provision, and and we have to do that. So, so I, I understand that there's federal law and I'm listening and I've been listening for the last couple of years and you have experts like like Mark when it comes to education and obviously yourself as superintendent. But at the end of the day, you're spending all this money and you have these needs and the kids have needs and there's special needs and everybody seems to have an individual need and you're spending 11,000 on some schools and 21,000 on, on others because of uh, specifics. 
at the end of the day, how do you gauge whether you're successful or not? Right. Right. At the end of the day, do, are we do, just do throwing you, money at it? Right. I mean, are you just throwing money at a problem and, and just kind of shoveling against the New Haven Harbor tide? I mean, I, I, I mean, <laughs> maybe you are. I don't know. I hope not. I hope not, too. Um, but there's an awful lot of money being spent on each kid. So somewhere along the line, I would love to know, um, you know, you have 200 kids enter or a, a grouping of kids, and it would obviously have to be a micro answer. Um, I mean, a macro answer as opposed to a micro answer, but you have, you know, a thousand kids that are, you know, kindergarten students in 2010. And did how many of those thousand kids graduated from high school and went on to higher education or went on somewhere else? Is there a way to gauge um, how successful Hartford is at educating their youth and educating the masses? I mean, you know, and pre and and you want to you want to know that you're throwing all this money at something, and and you're producing good, productive citizens, right? Whether they travel to another state or they stay in Hartford and work or or continue their education, but somewhere along the line, I would think that you want to know. I mean, I would like to know if I was a taxpayer in Hartford, um, you know, how successful all my tax money is at educating everybody's kids. Well, as, as it relates to students with um, exceptionalities or learning differences, um, we meet students where they are. And not only is that the federal law, but it's also our moral, moral obligation to do that. And, you know, when, when a student is able to return or transition to the least restrictive environment, that is a definition of success, um, right? And knowing that an out-of-district placement is the most restrictive environment. And so working backwards um, to the extent possible, um, right? When students move into college or career is another indicator for us. Um, but, um, you know, I also can't look at it as, um, you know, we're throwing all this money at something because it is it is a student's education plan that calls for all of these um, supports and each student and each plan has goals. Those goals look very different for a student. It might be a goal for a year for a student, you know, to be able to read X amount of, of words because of their specific, you know, learning exceptionality. Sure. Um, so it's, no, it's I, I understand all that. Yeah. I, and I and I and I understand that every kid is an individual and, and everybody has their own specific needs. But I, I hate to I don't really know how to term this again because I'm not an educator. But, you know, if, if you have 100 kids entering in, in, in kindergarten in, in 2010 or 2012 and, you know, 12 years later, and I'm not talking about kids that have special needs because they're obviously in a separate grouping or bucket or, or whatever. But if you have, you know, kids that go to school, they go to school for 12 years, 12 years, K through K through 12. You know, how many of the non special need kids are you successful with as a percentage of all the money that you're spending to educate them? Or is as soon as they hit 16 to you know, 50% of them drop out or do 80% of them go on and finish high school. And it'd be interesting to know that you're, you know, on, on, on a, on a normal given day, not a special needs person, not right. someone that, you know, that, that has specific issues, but if you're spending 11 or $12,000 per year per student, that 11 or $12,000, how productive is it? Um, are they able to read at a high school level when they graduate high school? Are they able to go on to college? Are they able to go somewhere and, and be productive? Are, are you producing productive citizens with the money that you're spending? I mean, where's the correlation? I, I'm just, and that's just me personally. I just love to know what that that is. And I hope, I hope it's, I hope it's a high number. Yeah, so we, we can certainly have another time in a presentation for what the state accountability system calls for, right? There's a about 20 indicators that the state has um, for each school district, 70% of our students do graduate within four years. Um, yeah. About 52% of those students enroll in post-secondary education. Um, and uh, last time we looked at the 2016 graduation cohort, 30% of those um, students were uh, persisting um, into their second year of college. So those are some key metrics. 
um, that we can we can point to. The other um, layer for us to consider is that um, you know we 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 can't just separate the special education student from the regular education student when we're thinking about holistic outcomes. Given that right there, they're all part of 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 a school community, and so. Um, understand but i do think that we do need to separate so so when i use the example of the 24000 at um rossins um elementary this that particular one has almost a 20% need but i do think it's important is is every student there cuz i did it per head is every student uh, receiving a cost is it 24000 or no it's really all of the students are 11,000, but we have 50 students that are really driving more like 45,000 per head. You with me? That changes the model. Yeah, so um, when, I, when I talked about the school starter budget, right? The school starter budget in my presentation where every school has a principal, um, yeah an AP, uh, a certain level of one counselor per 500 students, which by the way, looks very different in suburban towns. That is not the allocation, but I'll leave it there for now. Um, um, you know, teachers, right? So that's one way to look at what all students receive, regardless of regular education, special education, English learner. Then we have these other layers that we add um, for additional um, teachers Support. for our English learners, right? So we continue yep. to add uh, based yep. on the level of, of need. Um, yep. So that can be a way to get at your question, Miss 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 Kennison, right? Okay. How else does this play out? Um, yep. And that does not include the service provision per uh, required um, special education planning. OK. Let's move on. <laughs> um, it, does anybody else have any other questions? Because I would like to get onto the topic of the special education. No, but I, I, I'm, I'm wondering why Mr. Waxenberg is so quiet today. Well, he hasn't, he he hasn't had his chance. He knows he, this so well. He does. He does. He's coming. He's coming. His next top, the next, the next line item on the agenda is all Mr. Waxenberg, and the rest of us will be able to take a nap because he's going to drive instead of me. <laughs> I'm going to guess. Um, so let's move from the let's move from the budget and let's move to the special education data collection and your memo that you provided to the committee, um, and that's agenda item number four. And Christine, you have questions that you had asked, and I want to make sure they get answered during this time. Thank you. I'll be listening intently. <laughs> Great, and I'll and I'll introduce Mr. Uh, Patrick Gibson, who's the direct deputy director of the da data policy and special projects from the school and state finance project, who um, often works um, and partners with us to help us get at these um, complex challenges that we have. Hi, everyone. Hi I don't know if you would like me to just kind of give an overview of the of the memo and talk about the work that we did that resulted in that, or I'd be happy to skip right to questions, whatever the uh, committee would prefer. I think the memo, I think a quick overview would be helpful, I think, just so that everybody sure. has it in content. Wonderful. Um, as, a, as a bit of background here, I was part of a team that served as the interim uh, chief financial officer for Harvard Public School District. and. That engagement started, I believe, the fall of 2019 through maybe January or February of 2020, and we were involved in the budget development process for the district uh, for the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, and as part of that team, uh, we were tasked with looking at um, a, a pretty crucial part of the Harper Public Schools budget, which, as uh, this, the subcommittee knows, uh, is special education tuition and students leaving the district and students coming into the district and the uh, the bills that um, the, the district received for those students who are either outplaced by Harper Public School District or are receiving special education services uh, in, in choice districts and choice placements 
or are therefore outplaced by, let's say, an open choice provider like, um, you know, Avon Public Schools as a hypothetical example, and looking at uh, how to fit that number into uh, a budget proposal um, uh, in, in concert with the other uh, parts of, uh, you know, uh, the education, uh, the, the district budget. Um, and and uh, I think we we quickly learned that there's uh, it's kind of two two separate high level issues um, with special education tuition in Hartford in particular. Um, and and I, I would say I would I would expand one of them to the provision of special education services uh, in general. I am not a special education program expert, um, but I I we we did a, an enrollment projection analysis as part of the budget development process. And it, it quickly became clear to, to us that the qu sheer quantity of students leaving and entering the district through choice options on a yearly basis um, uh, really could hinder the ability for the district to achieve, I think, uh, the economies of, the quote unquote, economies of scale that uh, this particular subcommittee discussed earlier today um, in, in terms of, you know, if you, Within the num the large number of choice students leaving the district, let's say in the open choice program, I believe it's about 2,100 to 2,200 Hartford resident students um, uh, exercising open choice options outside of the district. Um, uh, it's it, it could be it could be varying on a, on a year to year basis that the number of students and as well as the needs of the students who exercise that choice option. So given given the fact that you don't necessarily know who will be in the district or the needs of those kids in the district. Um, it, it, it seems to me, uh, not as a program expert, but that, that could make it very difficult to say, okay, what are the resources we need in a specific school to uh, to provide, a, let's say, a self-contained program or some, some you know, a, economies of scale in a special education service, because it's you don't necessarily know who, you know, when it's September 1 or October 1, when you're making your enrollment count, um, the prior year, you don't necessarily know if the students you were delivering services to last year are in fact going to, it, it, what, if, what if they exercise a choice, choice option and head out? Um, and I think that this problem is particularly acute in, in Hartford, given the, Hartford has the, the largest uh, number of resident students uh, exercising choice options, uh, I think among Connecticut districts. And as, um, as Hartford, as the Nexus District, is responsible for paying the the, the costs of uh, of delivering the special education services, um, they're ultimately you know responsible for for paying that. Um, and I think the second related problem is um, from a tuition bill standpoint, we quickly looked at these numbers. And again, we are the numbers we looked at when we were in the district are slightly out of date. But I I took a quick a quick peek at the uh, the budget provided uh, the fiscal 22 budget that the superintendent provided. And it appears that the trend is continuing. Um, that we quickly looked and saw 10% year-over-year increases in private outplacements and public in-state tuition uh, uh, bills year over year, um, and those are about 33 million and 34 million dollars. They were in fiscal 20 uh, at least, um, respectively, and um, that re that resulted in a 9% increase year-over-year year, um, from 2019 to fiscal 2020. Um, and so when we were making our projection for fiscal 21, um, it, it, it could be the, uh, the uncertainty, right? If, um, if a large part of your special education tuition projection is reliant on how many open choice seats are available, how many Hartford, magnet, Hartford resident students, you know, um, pursue a magnet option, if those numbers, if, if Hartford magnet seats, you know, exercise remain, remain flat, right? Um, your number could be lower than than you projected, but if they, but if you know uh, magnet seats open up and you have a higher number of kids leaving the district, then uh, then you could you could have been in, in a situation which you uh, under project the, the amount. But um, setting aside kind of the predictability of that, it's it's merely the um, and the superintendent slide in her presentation um, you know spoke to this. Um, it's merely the you see that that recent five percent year over year increase. Um, in special education tuition, which um, in in a fiscally constrained environment, um, only adds to I think the the difficulty of uh, fitting that number within a budget um, because you 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 
on one hand, it's difficult to project the services that the district can deliver in district based on who is going to be where. And then on the second part, they're kind of faced with the, the increasing special education tuition um, and costs. And so I think um, one, of the, one of the key findings that I think I, I, I looked at in the second page of this memo is that um, uh, the tuition system is, right, it's a result of a lot of interconnected players, right? So Hartford as a, as a district is ultimately responsible for paying the cost of special education as they are the Nexus district. But um, they, uh, there are the magnet providers, there's the open choice program, and then there's also private special education outplacements, each who are kind of kind of kind of part of this. Um, and so I think that you know um, if there's if there's a, a will to increase predictability or stability in special education tuition expenditures, um, and this is all based on right state statute that um, all of these partners need to be part of you know some sort of solution to 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 make sure that um, Hartford can accurately forecast the the needs of uh, of the students they serve, or the needs of the students who will be um, uh, leaving the district through choice options, um, which is a, a pretty crucial component of the the Hartford budget. And when we look at the fiscal 22 request, which is about 100, I believe it's about 100 million dollars, which um, you know it's a little less than a quarter of the of the total uh, operating budget, I believe. So from a big picture perspective, um, it's difficult for Hartford to um, look at these these types of mobility of students leaving the district to exercise their choice options the thousands of students who are doing that while at the same time you have students entering the district through the interdistrict magnet program and uh you know and every year you have a, a new cohort of kids you know uh participating in both of those um choice uh streams which makes it difficult to uh plan internally and then if if, if planning could be perfect from a special education tuition perspective that num the, the 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 sheer increase in the percentage year over year um, is is certainly a budgetary difficulty for the district um, when uh, developing their budget. So um, again, I'm not a I'm not a, a, a program expert, but we looked at some of the um, the tuition amounts as well as we're pretty familiar with the choice um, education funding system through some of our other work. And thinking about these two things um, in in alignment is. Uh, is how you end up with a situation where where Hartford's in a, in a very uh, difficult spot. So I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions. Any of the members have any questions? I don't, I, I'm, just, I'm not sure that the issue, uh, data is data. Uh, projections are based on history, they're based on uh, the history and projected data as best you can do in the environment that exists. You know, the research that we do um, drives such data. My issues, uh, but when you rely on the data to determine the program or the rationale for expenditures, that's to me that's a problem because data uh, is um, can be looked at in a variety of different ways. For example, um, of the annual open choice students that leave the district. Over the past five years, how many have come back to district as a percentage for predictability purposes? In other words, if 5% of your students on an annual basis decide, I don't like open choice, I want to come back to Hartford, you have somewhat of a data source to predict the future. Conversely, if you have a percent of students that decide they want to go into open choice, even though there's only so many slots available, you can predict based on the availability of slots. So um, I get the uh, the uh, the research and the data, but to me, it's more uh, 
programmatic, so I'll save my comments uh, for that because you have to, or you don't have to do anything, but uh, my involvement with this whole open choice started with Bruce Douglas and Chef First O'Neill, et cetera, and the abdication by the state legislature to address its burgeoning abuses by various school districts um, is an issue that now has come to the fore. And that's a that's for another that's for a discussion when we get into the um, percentages that are to me just outrageous as to special education students in an open choice system and Hartford's open choice system um, and the costs associated with that as well as excess costs and total uh, total uh, budgetary allocations of over $100 million, which is well over 25% of their budget. You, you, what you're in effect doing is, is squeezing money out of a budget for services, for cost of services that in my mind, is not being monitored, is uh, um, programmatically, one doesn't know if it's accurate or not. Uh, you're just based on goodwill because you have 25, 28 school districts. And uh, you're left, what's left behind, 75% of the dollars, is being used for your regular education students and uh, well, let's just say regular education students programmatically. And that's an ever dwindling amount of money if you have an ever increasing amount of money of special education. Even though there's an education uh, cost reimbursement, that money doesn't come to the Board of Education. That money goes to the, uh, to the city, which I'll talk about, ask Superintendent about later, if there's any reimbursement from the city, which I know there probably isn't. Um, so you have this, this um, need, this educational need that in my mind uh, is being taken advantage of for fiscal, fiscal purposes by, um, by uh, folks, the other districts and Hartford unfortunately based on what I've read, does not have the personnel to oversee if there's any abuses going on. Uh, and uh, the building of the correct dynasty by Bruce Douglas in the 90s uh, has had serious implications for Hartford that are not coming home to roost. And how do we deal with that? And unfortunately, the superintendent is trying to deal with it, but it it is what it is. She's limited in her uh, fiscal capacity. So um, it is absolutely clear in my mind that there is, uh, and I agree that open choice has contributed, if not uh, a driver, for costs, for I don't want to say inflated costs, for excessive costs that are injuring the Hartford School Board budget. She's not going to get any more money out of the local taxpayers in Hartford, I don't believe. Uh, federal and state dollars, that's a jump ball based on the economy. So when you have a defined uh, uh, amount of money, and you have to address it by statute and by law to a group of children that need servicing, but such servicing is being driven by somebody other than your own uh, district, like these tuition costs, which are questionable at times, at best, uh, you're subject to the I hate to say it, but to the ill will of people that are looking to make a few dollars on the side. 
And to me, if they're not, fine. But the ability to, to uh, charge Hartford for costs is there because there is little to no oversight programmatically, policy-wise, and in a fiduciary uh, capacity due to limited personnel and such large, you got 28 school districts, large variances, they're just, <clears throat> so, you know, they're easily subjected to to the, uh, to the I don't want to say whims, but I get frustrated because I know the game so well. Uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to various school districts costs and analysis. That's why some of the things, and I, I want to thank the superintendent for getting back some of the questions, but even more importantly, are some of the tables that I asked for that unfortunately we did not, were not able to, to get, which basically are the percentages of special education students. There's 2,243 special education students, choice students, mm -hmm. according to the first answer from the superintendent. Yep. Out of how many? How many choice students? What percentage is that? In other words, do we have 10,000 students? Is that 25%? Is it 40%? Nobody knows if they came into, if superintendent admits, Nobody knows if they left the district with an IEP and then all of a sudden entered into Avon. I'm using, I don't mean to harp on Avon, but using that as an example, they went to Avon. They were two grade levels behind. Avon tested them and said, oh, this child is learning disabled. Therefore, we're going to uh, PPT him. Hartford has no say. They PPT him. They start billing Hartford for services of a child that needs intervention, not special education. There's a difference. True. And nobody, nobody is overseeing it. Uh, it's Mark, 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 could I uh, put a question? I, I think you're on to something uh, as you have been for a while. Is the, the lack of oversight one of poor management or legal impediments? I think it probably is both. I don't say it's a legal impediment. Uh, uh, this could not have a say. Hartford could say, "I want to say in this." Yes, and there's no, there's no. Uh, the only that's a my, legal impediment, right? To my recollection, the only uh, say that Hartford has regarding special education and the creation of an IEP is in the charter schools. That's clearly in statute. Uh, but when I asked the question of the superintendent about their ability to do the PPT, uh, PPT, uh, she stated no. So they, the child is handed, I don't want to say handed off, but handed off to the new district. Hartford could say we'd like to participate. Um, even if participation is a good thing. But, you know, you may not have any say because the district is the one that has to provide the services. They're not legally, uh, they have no legal right to participate in such a PPT. Teachers have no legal, ironically, uh, until recently had no quote unquote legal right to comment on the PPTs. So it's a whole uh issue that needs to be dealt with educationally but in hartford's case it's uh to me um uh, i feel very strongly that hartford is being subjected to um not necessarily special education but remediation services that are being identified as special education i could be wrong uh uh, I hope I am, but based on what I've read and the percentages, the data, it just doesn't do that. The data for um, superintendent's responses here in 
six, she says, this, uh, she, not she, but the data and her response is 4,318 students uh, for 2018-19, it's probably the PSIS number out of the state, uh, are identified out of, let's assume 20,000. And the superintendent can call me an idiot anytime she wants, it's, that's happened quite a bit. Um, she won't be the only one, she'd have to get in line. Uh, uh, Mark. <laughs> that's about that's about 25%, roughly. So, and then the choice students the same year is 2,243 based on uh, the response from the superintendent in question number one. Again, what are those percentages? If they're equal, one could argue, well, hey, you have an equal amount of special education students and open choice and in, 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 in district, what's the issue? The issue may be a little bit of oversight, but if that 2243 is 30% of choice or 40% of choice, I have to question saying, wait a second, you mean to tell me open choice students are more inclined to be special education students? You know, it just doesn't, and, and that's what I think the messaging is. That's my interpretation of the messaging that I have heard in the past, but I don't know if that is true or not. Um, Mark, I, th I think that you really um, have really touched upon a lot of important uh, items here. And um, Bob, thank you for piggybacking because I do think it, it you know, Mark, you're, the, you're, as well as the superintendent, you're the expert in the room. And this is, you know, what, what you're very familiar with. Um, and Superintendent, I think that you have, and we had a pre-meeting before this meeting, um, and we had gone over some data with yourself and your spe special ed person and uh, Jen. And um, you said that you've you've hired some staff. So as Mark is talking about these items, and we're talking about the possibly the lack of management, you have even mentioned that you know we don't you don't have the resources in that area. Now, um, knowing that we might be getting some federal funding in the very near future, where most people would put that into infrastructure, and and I know it's slotted for specific uh, uses, but can we make steps and strides to begin to manage this and to you know look at the 100 million is we're we're talking about for open choice and a portion of that is special ed can we begin to put in some type of managing monitoring um it, taking baby steps so that this way okay if you're going to start to evaluate some of these students uh do we start with a, a group? Do we start to build a program? And then the program gets bigger and bigger so that you can. I think if you start to get an oversight, it's kind of like, you know, there's different ways that you can look at it. If, uh, if nobody, when we had a lot of theft, if you don't have police, then you're going to continue to have theft. That person that, you know, has the little store on the corner is going to continue to have theft. But when you start to have police presence, it stops. So I think that there is a, a, a part where you need to um, move towards being involved. And I don't know what that level is, but it's an investment. And I think it's an investment that you've started to make, but I think we, you, you maybe need to continue. And I'm sure that that's your goal. Yeah, so the investment that we're doing um, is actually for um, internal, um, right, our students and making sure that we ourselves are not, don't have an over-reliance. I, I, I have mentioned before that, you know, years ago in Hartford Public Schools, um, there was a push to um, outplace, outsource students, right? There was oh. um, this, um, it became a, a, the way of work. Um, at one time. Now, you know, these are students that now are, are high schoolers, right? And so, as we know, to reverse an out-of-district placement, that's really hard to do. You're not going to do so, that. They're, so those they're gonna investments phase out. that we're yeah. doing are, right, foundational internally to us. Um, you know, it's really hard, um, and, I, and I do agree with Mark that, that there are uh, policy legal implications here because, um, you know, yes, we own the IEP, Right. We own it. We pay for it. And the district has to implement the IEP. But um, 
if we're going to say we want to be at the table, um, then we need staffing to do that. And I don't think that it should be us. Harvard Public Schools identifying budget um, resources to have that when when this is not just a Harvard Public Schools issue, right? This is an issue that's part of a larger ecosystem um, that that we are a part of, but not the only party. That's that's part of this. I I think there's an inequity there if the the expectation is for Hartford to identify additional funds in their budget to have staffing to attend you know all these ppts um we're not saying we wouldn't we we would need the resources to be able to do that um and then that's step one then you know we we become part of a team right because um just because we're at the table doesn't mean that we we're gonna have you know the say you know a ppt process is it is called a planning and placement team for a reason because it it includes you know, the educators, the at oftentimes advocates, parents, the students. Understand. I just want to be conscientious of our time. If others have um, some questions that they have for the superintendent, we do have a hard stop today at 12 o'clock because we have another board meeting following this. So I want to give um, our board members that that uh, participate in the next board meeting of the MARB, um, an opportunity to have a quick break and then come back. So I do um, want to be conscious of our time. Anybody else have any questions? Ms. Kennison, can I just clarify Mr. Waxenberg's quest data question Please. so that I can- um, You may. Uh, so the question was how many of total choice students Mr. Waxenberg are Special education. I, I can you repeat your question, please? Your data question. Uh, according to to your uh, your response, there was the, the, in eighteen nineteen, which is the most recent year you can probably use. Uh, it's like twenty two hundred. I think I said okay. Twenty two forty three. Twenty two forty three total. That's an answer. Question number one. Out of how many total choice open Understand. choice students? Okay. You know, and and, and as a percentage, and and let me just because we do have a hard stop and I don't want to surprise anybody. It, it is my intent, I think it's serious enough and I don't expect Hartford, I don't want to place Hartford in a position to determine or create a hostile environment within the open choice uh, or chef school districts. I think that Marb, uh, and I'll forward this through Julian to, to, the, to the various uh, leadership uh, people within OPM. I think there needs to be an investigation by SDE, uh, and I'll highlight the included but not limited to pieces and parts for legal purposes, because I do honestly believe that back in the 90s when this was created, there was no real thought given to where we are today. So what you have is an explosion of costs associated with students who need servicing the question is, are districts taking advantage of that quote unquote servicing uh, for a variety of different purposes? Uh, and and uh, I think SDE needs to investigate, even though there's open choice in Bridgeport and there's open choice in New Haven and all these other places, that's very limited. But in Hartford with 28 school districts, I think, as you said, uh, Kim, if they know, the, uh, you know, if, if, and I don't want to use it, even though you've used the analogy, if they know somebody's looking over their shoulder, they're going to behave a little differently. They are. And, they, and, and, and if the state investigation, if there is one, um, identifies holes that allow these bad actors, hopefully there are none, to to get through uh, for fiscal reasons, uh, and I'm not only talking fiscal, I'm talking programmatic and policy. Uh, then there needs to be either legislative changes or policy changes statewide relative to reporting, as they do with the PSIS system and all these other systems that they've created, to clearly identify or maybe create one for the chef system. Because what you're doing for chef, if this continues the way you're going, 
the chef is going to be at a disadvantage for the students of Hartford. They're not going to have the funds to satisfy the needs of the quote unquote regular education student because they're being siphoned off by an archaic afterthought special education process. So it's, it's um, to me, I think, uh, uh, an investigation rather than a cons uh, consultant would be more appropriate because investigation heightens the um, severity of what you're looking for, not looking for any wrongdoing. You're looking for holes that exist uh, that are just not good practice. Thank you. We're down to three minutes. I don't know if the superintendent agrees, disagrees, or wants to get in line. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just a hard dynamic that um, at times um, feels to Hartford Public Schools that we're, we're you know, just in a hamster wheel. Um, it's really hard for yeah. predictability purposes. Yeah, and for me, the way I get out of that with a, being a CFO and I have overseen, you know, distressed companies, financially distressed, is to, I have to rely on the data, I have to rely on the numbers, I have to rely on the trends, and yes, there is that humanistic and support that we have to provide, but it, but um, I, I do think that sometimes, again, whether it's an investment of people, time, to do nothing and continue to to uh, allow this to, if you're saying, Mark, that they could be taking funds away from your regular r children that are in there getting educated, then um, th that I think needs to, we need to be aware of it uh, and, Kim, and make uh, movement. Kim, yes. Kim, 30 seconds. Um, Please. Uh, I think that given the sensitivity that Hartford has being in the system, as the superintendent says, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, she is trying to go faster on the, the squirrel wheel. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, I think Marb can help because can. this would not be coming from Hartford. Uh, and as you know, someone could play back this tape and it's coming from the Marb. It and is. I think that may 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 help. Um, uh, I don't know what legislative committees deal with this, but that, that's probably not the place to go. Um, but but I, I do think Hartford, uh, I do think the MARB can can play a positive role uh, in, 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 in doing this by taking some of the flack. And, uh, you know, the people that don't like it from the suburbs can uh, get in the line uh, to, to get it, Mark. So, and if not in the line, so. Oh. So I would just I would just echo um, those comments and add my support to what Bob just described. I think we should strategize on how to do that uh, most effectively. Um, I know in conversations we've had with the mayor, we've talked about kind of broader issues around it's the burden it bears uh, for providing services where, you know, against a, a very small tax base and people who benefit yes. from Hartford don't pay towards Hartford. And it's part of a much broader policy discussion that, you know, we've we've kind of kind of touched upon it, but maybe we need to just really kind of think about whether a formal kind of assessment or recommendation or commentary on this to the governor and to other stakeholders is is appropriate. And that deserves its own separate discussion, I think. I agree. Thank you, Christine. Um, we do have another action item to on our agenda today, um, and I'm going to look to table that action, which is uh, to get an update on the corrective action plan because we're at 12 o'clock. Um, I know Leanne is on the, I think Leanne is on the phone. Are you? Oh, maybe she's I, not. I think she dropped off. But, she um, did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I saw your report, it's included in here, so um, I can see that progress has been made. Um, I think we can get an update um, at, the, at the next meeting on, on that item. 
Absolutely. Well, because we have Charisse here to talk. Yeah, and and the report is the report is included, so it's not as if we don't have the information. Um, at this time, we're at twelve oh one. I'm going to look for a motion um, to adjourn. But before I do that. Superintendent, thank you very much for coming today and presenting your budget and having this healthy discussion around education. And please know that we are here to support you. We are here to, uh, you know, help assist really for you to manage and maneuver through these uh, tough topics of discussion and, um, you know, appreciate your good works. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Christine. All in favor? Aye. 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 Everybody? Anybody opposed? I didn't hear everybody. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Bob? Uh, Aye. Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny today. I didn't hear Fel signal either, but we shall adjourn. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good day and have a nice weekend coming up. Thank you.